them. And basically what we're doing here, this is part three of it, what we're doing here is literally going through the scriptures finally to see exactly the patterns that our master and our leader has set in place for us to follow to achieve the miraculous, to achieve where the doctors have uh, become exhausted in what they can do, and only now the maker can do, the manufacturer of us. Well, therefore, we're going into that manual to see exactly how we should go about it. I have some terrible, terrible and sad news. Uh, my family has experienced one of our members passing on, and the person of Hugh Walken, uh, otherwise known as Tommy, and I'm sure many people know him, especially from the Eight Mile Rock, you know, first cousin of mine, two, two sisters, kids. And it was really, really sad to hear the news about his passing. Uh, Tommy and I slept in the same bed together. In fact, I lived with them in Eight Mile Rock in my entire high school life. <laughs> so, so clearly, I, I, I would have felt that. I want to say condolences to his wife, Crystal, his children, uh, his only sister, Barbara, and, you know, and everyone else in the family uh, who it would have been a great, great blow to. Uh, before he passed on, of course, many people were praying that you know he would pull out of it. Uh, many people from all over the world was praying. Many people contacted their intercessors locally as well as internationally, praying and praying and praying, hoping God's best. Well, uh, it is God that give life and it's God that take away life. So the only thing we could hope for right now and believe him coming from the background that he came from is present with the Lord. He would have made the right decision. And I love that scripture that says that wherever there's life, in spite of the situation, wherever there's life, there's hope. There's hope to, to get it right. No matter where you are in life, if you have life, there is always hope. So again, my condolences to his family, his father, again, his wife, his sisters, his kids, and everyone, all of us, aunts, uncles that love him, and you know, there's nothing that we could have done here. Uh, the will of God was carried out, and like with everything else, we must accept it and move on. And of course, we learn from each life that has uh, passed on where we can be better in life, using them as uh, an example of the things that we should and should not do in life. So we thank God for the life of Tommy Walken. We thank God for his time here, 52 years on the earth, 52 years. We thank God for that, and we give God the glory for his time here uh, with us, all right? So again, we're going to continue with part three of this very, very dynamic, very, very challenging teaching. And this teaching is to really uh, kick out of the ballpark the traditions of foolery and foolishness that we subscribe to uh, for so long. I remember, I'm going to tell you this story. <clears throat> I remember this story uh, years ago. There was a particular, I'm not going to call any names, there was a particular organization that took a particular company to court because this organization felt that by law, they had a right to come on the premises of this company and demand their books and so on and so forth to check their records to see if they were doing what is lawfully right. So the company now, this, this organization that did this, they was doing it to several merchants. But this particular company had had enough with their foolishness and decided to take the matter before the courts. And the person that was sent to the court to represent this particular organization, one of the first questions the magistrate put to this person who represented that organization was, what gave you the right? What rules were you operating under to force your way into this particular uh, company and demand to see their records or their books? So. And this is the way that was, the story was told me. 
So it's, it was alleged that he said, listen, this is the way that we always did it. So the magistrate or judge or whomever said, no, 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 I didn't ask you how you always did it. I'm asking you, by what authority, by what law, by what rule? Because the laws and the rules would have meant that there was a, a higher power who would have counseled with each other. This higher power that was accepted by the people that we're going to choose you to make the laws for us and we're going to abide by those rules. So we, the court, and the people want to know what rules and whose authority were you operating or even representing. Again, he said, this, ma'am, your honor, this is how we, 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 we do it this way. And who would this we be? Would it be the governing authority? No, it would be this organization. Is this organization the governing authority? No. But Kevin, what this have to do with what we're talking about? This have a lot to do. This have a lot to do with what we have to, to deal with today. Because you see, what that gentleman was doing, he was following a bullying tradition that because they were part of the law enforcement of this particular country, that they could intimidate people and go around and making their own rules until this matter was brought, brought before a judge and the judge had to set the record straight, okay? Putting things back in alignment and putting things back into perspective. I call this spiritual, uh, uh, What's the word I want to use? Spiritual, it's like a spiritual chiropractor. You, you're bringing the body back in line from the rubbish and the foolery and nonsense that people have subscribed to for years. Well, of course, the judge would have given a ruling in favor of the company that was violated by this particular person and their organization. Okay, now bringing that home today, we're gonna, and I'm not gonna do a recap because I have a lot to cover today. I have a lot to cover today, and I really want to jump out with, on, in the, on the blocks with this because there's a lot I have to cover, and I'm gonna pick up from where I left off last week with Matthew 10 because the basis of what we're going to be discussing today is based on that. So, of course, our topic is He said His Word. And heal them, part three, our key scripture is Psalms 107, verse 20. And our subtopic is titled, The Word or Their Word. Let me repeat that again. The subtopic today is the word or the word, meaning the word of God, or their word, meaning the words of of unauthorized mere mortals. Oh Lord, we're going deep today. I also brought today with me my belt because I'm about to admin administer, sorry, uh, some, like we say in the Bahamas, some cut hip. Okay, I'm about to, like they say in Guyana, I'm about to, 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 to give out some lashes right now, okay? And again, the idea of these teachings, as you would agree, whether you want to agree or not, are strictly Bible based. Nothing here is Kevin's view, nothing here is Kevin's opinion, nothing here is how Kevin feel, nothing here is Kevin's personal quotes from day one. As I delivered these teachings to you, I littered you with a myriad of scriptures. I didn't give you no nursery rhymes. I didn't tell you, quote somebody else. I quoted the word of the living God. Okay? That's all I did. So today, I want to delicately take my time and go through the scriptures as usual, showing you, when you, in, 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 you can read it for yourself, where it's just criminal, spiritual, spiritually criminal, the, the miss and intentional diagnosis levied upon, upon the body of Christ 
and particularly those who uh, are laden with spirits of infirmity or sickness or disease. When in Psalms 107 verse 20, God said, I've sent my word, and the, the revelation is very simple. The word here is Jesus Christ. I have sent my word and heal them and to save them from their destruction. So what is going to heal the body of Christ from their physical ailments, which for the most part has originated from a spiritual perspective, and what's gonna save them from their destruction? Well, according to what we would have read, that's recorded in Psalms 107 verse 20, it says that the word is going to do this. And of course, in part one and part two, I would have taken my time and gave you scripture after scripture as it relates to the word of God being Jesus Christ. That was the revelation. You must believe Jesus. You must believe the Bible. You must believe the scriptures. You must believe the word. You must believe the Messiah. You must believe Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the ministry, there is not a shred of evidence, forensic or empirical evidence, where our Jesus who became the sacrifice to appease the Father, which is God, in an effort to reconcile him, us back to God, him. This is the person I'm speaking of right now. We are going to see, as we've been seeing, he never, he never, he never required not a one, not one of his leaders, not one of his disciples, and not one of us today who are the leaders of the, the, the body of Christ in terms of being shepherds over them. None of us had he given a, a different set of instructions contrary to the word of God that nowadays, okay, yes, Jesus is the word. Yes, Jesus is the word made flesh. That is true, saints, but, but, we're living in a new age now, and you got to free up off that money. I want to be clear. I love to be clear, and I'm and listen to me. Let me be clear. I can never stop beating down these pulpit bandits. I can never stop beating down these pulpit beggars for money because it is not what Jesus left in place. And everyone who is mad is a pulpit bandit. Everyone who is mad is a seed beggar or a seed beggar or pulpit bandit supporter. I won't be clear. I don't ever want you to get confused where my position is on this. You are thieves. You are liars. Because what we will read, Jesus never gave you a mandate to put a price tag on the free gift of healing on the free gift of deliverance. Tell them, say, listen, I ain't gonna charge you for no healing, but help us build the church, no problem. Help us buy the bus, no problem. Help us do this, no problem, then say that. But don't say, I hear God. I hear God say a thousand. I hear your, you, your tongue ought to be cleaved to your top mouth. You are a liar. Now, let's pick up from where I left off last week in uh, Matthew chapter 10, okay? Matthew chapter 10, because I'm gonna pick up from then, we're gonna go deeper. And the reason why we're gonna go deeper is because we wanna make it make sense. People hear me and hear me well, and I know, I know that the narrative changes will want to say, you know, he, he bash in the past this. And you are right, I am bashing the no good pastors, the fake pastors, the false prophet, but not the good ones. Not the one who believe that Jesus is the, the, the word made flesh. Not those who believe, uh, Revelation 19 verse 13, where it says that, and Jesus was called or named the word of God. No, not those ones, they're the good, decent ones. I don't mean them, but the rest are wrong. Not the rest of them, the rest are wrong. That's who I'm talking to right now. 
All right, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 11, I think it is, it says, we ought to expose the works of darkness because we will be equally as guilty knowing the truth and never shared it with others to be set free from the so-called freedom they was paying for for years. They're about to shut that baby down right now, right? So let's go, we're gonna pick up, like I said, off of where I left off last week. I intentionally ended on that particular scripture because it was my intent to expound more on it this week, okay? So Matthew 10, beginning at verse one, and it says, and when he, which is Jesus, had called unto him his 12 disciples, listen what he did. It says that he charged them for the power that he gave them. No, I didn't read that, no. He formed a hundred, two hundred, five hundred, six hundred, and a thousand dollar line based on the amount of power that he was about to give them. And so this was going to be the cost. No, I didn't read that. He told them, I'm going to give you this power, but in order for you to become wealthy, you got to charge those for them to be healed. I did not read that. Will you read for us, for us, and for those who cannot read, read for us what Jesus did because the deal is here he is the leader he is the head okay he is also the mediator between us and God so if there's anyone whose pattern we ought to follow it should be who Mr. Jesus good Matthew 10 verse 1 and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples he gave he didn't charge them he gave them power against what? Unclean spirits. This was free Ewing? Yes. And not only did he give them power against unclean spirit, meaning he's equipping them to challenge the invisible forces that's oppressing humanity. That is the core and the root of all of the troubles we see today. So Jesus is saying, it would be unfair for me to just send you there and say, now you go there and you just flip out and do foolishness all day. And then the devils can go, no, 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 no. He said, I, got, I the power generator, got to give you some of this power to fight these devils. So Jesus said here, he gave them, he didn't charge them, he gave them power uh -huh, against unclean spirits. Mm-hmm. And what this power is supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to cast them out. Who's them? The unclean spirits. And do what? And to heal. Wow, this is a combo package. So you're telling me, Jesus, that this power that you're giving your followers, the believers in you, for free. Let me be clear here now, because I don't see a clause where you said, I'm giving it to you free, Kevin. I'm giving it to you free, T.D. Jakes. I'm giving it to you free, Joel Osteen. I'm giving it to you free, local pastors. But you got to charge those who you administer these gifts upon. I, I, I don't know. I am hard pressed to see this in here, even under a microscope. I trying to help you today because I'm trying to show you you've been taking the wrong prescriptions. And if you continue on that road, you will leave. The only healing you will get is when you transfer from time into eternity, all right? So it says, he gave them power against, this was specifically against, against what? Unclean spirits. Are unclean spirits visible or tangible? No, they're not. So the power that he's giving me is to challenge the opposition of the unseen. Because he, basically he's saying now this is going to be the root behind what he's about to say next. He says, I've given them power against unclean spirits. Why? To cast them out and to heal. To heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Mighty Lord. Jesus is so clear. This is my leader. This is my leader. I have to follow my leader. I don't know who you're following, but I follow my leader. He says, Kevin, as a child of God, I have endowed you spiritually, okay, with a power specifically for unclean spirits, okay? 
and the power is to cast the unclean spirit out as a result of that it should bring healing to all manner of sickness and diseases god i got you on that man so why do i fail to find in this matthew 10 verse 1 any form of financial cost to the receivers of these uh, gifts number one they did not have to pay for it and why don't I don't see any additional cost or anywhere to those who would be participants of receiving the healings and so on I don't see any right so let's drop all the way to uh, let's drop all the way to verse uh, five it says, these 12 Jesus sent forth. He sent them out now. But did he send them empty? No, he sent them spiritually equipped with what, he, with, with what he gave them in verse 1 of Matthew 10. Right? And that is the power, okay, over un, against unclean spirits to cast them out. And as a result of removing the spirit, because that was the whole reason behind the sickness and disease. And he says, now, the power that you have is to knock this spirit out, knock the spirit of cancer out, knock the spirit, excuse me, of diabetes out, knock the spirit of HIV out, knock the spirit of glaucoma out. They're all, in spirit, no, they're all under the label of spirits of infirmity or weakness or sickness. He said, but this power I'm giving you, you, if you are a believer of me and you accepted me and believe that I am the word made flesh, I am the word that God sent to heal you. I am the word of God, according to Revelation 19, verse 13. If you believe that, listen, listen, your title have nothing to do with this power. Boom, you got the power right now to knock these things out. But like I say, you're not seeing any of this because I would have said in my voice and second teaching. And I said to you that, your, your subscription, your, your subscription and your belief of the word will determine your quality of life or how the word works for you. What you accept, believe, and do will now result in the promises of God. But don't tell me, I believe in God for healing, but I'm doing no works to attach to that healing, to attach to what I believe, my faith that is. So I will not receive the promises. So the modern day robbers decided, okay, I'm going to put a spin on it then. Okay, let your works be giving us money. Let your work be buying. See, we have, look here, come online. See, we have to this church, we have what we call a store where we sell merchandise. So if you really want to put your faith to works, what you do is you buy the anointed pillow, you know, for adults, that's $50. And your children are a little smaller, so we got the anointed pillow for the children, and that's forty-five dollars. We only taking five dollars off because the head ain't that much smaller, so we can charge you for that. Now we got the anointed soap, okay? We got the anointed underwear, we got that too. We got the anointed bra and and coat suit. We got we got. In fact, we got everything here except what in the Bible. So listen to this. He said in verse 12, this is verse 5 of Matthew 10, okay, coming off the heels of verse 1, after he didn't give them all of this free power, because he, there's no limits. You, the power, as long as you operate in faith, and you, you will see it come to pass, okay? Verse 5 said, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city, into the, and into any city of the Samaritans, into ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go preaching, this is the prerequisite to now engaging the free power that he gave you to cast a devil to begin the exercise of bringing about healing of all manner of sickness and disease. Okay? So he says in verse 7 of Matthew 10, and as you go preaching, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who is the king? Jesus Christ. Verse 8, I love, because it really directly reflect, reflects verse 1 of Matthew 10. He says, now, heal the sick. Jesus speaking to the same ones he gave the power to. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. 
Okay, Jesus. But you see, Jesus, who was all-knowing, who knows the end from the beginning, he knows some of them would get beside themselves and believe that this power is coming directly from them. He would now take the scene that people are now being healed and says, now look here now, this is my anointing. Okay, now after I just preached this good word, you need to tap into this anointing. So now what they're going to do now, listen to these, these crooks. They're going to now franchise the anointing on them as if this is some kind of Burger King or Wendy's where you could have franchises all over the world. So they tell people wherever they go, uh, tap into this anointing. Sow a seed into the, sow a seed into what? You're selling the anointing of God? Where did you get this permission from? Whose authority are you under? You devil? You worker of iniquity? You misleader? That's not what your master did for you. He gave it to you freely. So where, where did you insert as a part of the prescription for the sick body of Christ, some of them, where did you add this, where, where did you get this from that now there is a cause to this? Liars. I have no respect for no preacher on this planet who put a cause on the anointing of God, on the healing, free healing powers that God has given him. Again, let's be clear. If come and be clean, listen, we want to build a new church. We want to build a new wing. We want a church bus. We're trying to raise funds so we can pay them. Tell them that, but don't tell them. In order for that to happen, you got to sow a seed or pray for, pay for a miracle or pay for all kinds. You are a liar. And Kevin Ewing will never respect you. Never. Because for me to do that, I am putting you above the clear instructions that I'm reading. Hence, I honor you more than I honor God. And you will never see that, you pulpit bandit. You casino prophet, you will never see that in this life. Never. And this is the kind of indignation people should have. You should be, you should be insulted when a clown tell you, Plant your seed in the ground for your healing. Well, what is this? Well, what is this? What, 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 what ground? What ground is this? Huh? Could Jesus, could, could, sir, could you kindly show me, okay? In the Gospels, where Jesus left his blueprint in place, show me where Jesus tell anyone he healed. The deaf man, the blind man, the one possessed with demons and devils, all of these people who were sick, who had diseases and he healed them. I see absolutely no demonstration where he required them to purchase an oil, to purchase a scarf, to purchase a pillow. All of these prior to the healing. No, what I did see, what he tell them, he said, now go forth before you do any healing and preach the kingdom is here. Who's this? Jesus the Christ. Tell him I'm here now. And you are coming as a representative whom I have endowed with the power to release them of the evil spirits, to heal all manner of sickness and this mighty God. You are, you are you with us today. But then there's somebody right now. See there, you still got to see there. They, 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 they're ignorant. Ignorant to the fact they will look at the word, read the word, see many demonstrations of what Jesus did, but still come and fight for these pulpit bandits. Still given money for free healing. Where's your brain? Can you not read? How much longer? You're now into year 2022 and you are pleading, please put the shock on me again. I don't ever want to be free of the sickness. I want to give my money till, my, till I die. Wow. Mighty Lord. So listen, verse 8, Matthew 10. He says, now you heal the sick, clean the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Okay? He's telling them to do it because he has equipped them freely with what it takes to do it. And nowhere in there do we see a article 2.41 that says, but you have to charge them. No. We do see an article here, but listen what this article read. It reads, freely ye have, who's ye? Those in verse 1 of Matthew 10, that he gave power against unclean spirits to cast them out, 
so that they will now be able to heal all manner of sickness and disease. This is what he's talking about. So what is he specifically telling them that just about every church is violating today? Well, he says here in Matthew 8, the last, last sentence, he says, freely you have given the power to, freely you have received it from me, the power, then freely you should give the healing to those who you come in contact with. Mighty God. I'm ready to pack up and go home right now. Because I don't see no reason why I should go any further than that. All of these scriptures I got here, these are just going to amplify. And I, I could literally pack up, turn off my set right now, okay? Okay, and tell Dove, put the credit to my next show. <laughs> because I mean, I don't see why. I don't see why I should proceed. Look here, look here. A person with no brain could understand this. How do we extract charging the people who's coming looking for relief from their sicknesses? How, how could you have a heart to charge these people when your leader, your leader, your leader set the example, who gave it to you freely, never cost you a dollar? But somehow you had your accounting department come up with a price for those who you feel you healing, not Jesus, and you're charging them. Mighty Lord, boy, I, I don't know. I always say, I say this all the time, hell is too good for y'all. Now, why is this a problem? Why is good? Because you see, when it comes to the money factor, it's a problem. Why is this? Let's go. We can see why. If, if, if you continue to take this route, let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, all right? And we're going to read from verse 10 to verse 11. And we're going to listen very carefully what the scripture is saying. He says in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, For the love, for the love of money, uh-huh, is the branch of all evil? No. Is the leaf of all evil? No. Is the fruit of all evil? No. What is the love? It didn't say, it, it, it did not read, for money is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. The love of it, the love of it is the root. And everything begins from where? The root. The love of money is the root of all evil, but this is the part I love. Which while some coveted after, or they lost, he's talking about the believers now. He's talking about those who got the free gift given to them, the gift of healing, the gift to cast out evil spirits, that will now uh, perpetuate the, 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 the healing of all sicknesses and disease. That's who we're talking about. He, he's telling them, listen, the love of money is the root of all evil. So what he's saying is that if once money is your heart and your God and your goal, then everything that you're doing is based from an evil perspective. So that means you're going to lie, which what you're doing when you're charging them. You're going to deceive them. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell them, I hear God say that there's someone here right now who have HIV. And God says, if you make a sacrifice, not obey my word. If you make a sacrifice, not help the poor, do my commandment. No, and the sacrifice is go get a thousand dollars or even two. It's going to heal you. Wow. Wow. So listen to this. The love of money is that that devil is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, he's talking about some of the saints who've been given the gift, now they after money. Listen, they have, who's the day? He's talking about believers. He's not talking about sinners. He's talking about the believers, those who've accepted Jesus Christ, because he's showing you if you don't stop being filled with yourself, if you don't sit your arrogant behind down, if you don't calm yourself down and realize that Jesus Christ is the healer, Jesus is the word made flesh, it is through them believing Jesus that their deliverance and healing, would, if you don't come to grips with that and let that be concrete in your understanding, then you are going to be this right here a lover of money. Everything is going to be a cost to the people of God. So he says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, while, which while some, which while some of them run after or covered after. Listen, they have, the believers have erred from the faith. 
To err means to make a mistake. The deeper meaning of that word is to not only make a mistake, but to now go into the opposite direction of where you should have been going. So we say, now, what is this mistake they're making? What, what is this evil that they're doing because of the love of money? Well, they see how lucrative this healing business is because God ain't going to stop the healing. No, that's their gift. And a part of the spiritual rules is your gifts are without repentance. People heal other people while they were not saved. Why? Because it's their gifts. Have nothing to do with their salvation. He says the gifts are without repent. You do not have to repent to God and then he give you the gift. No, 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 no. He says, I've outfit you with that before the foundation of the world. He says, according to Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the Lord our God who has already blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual, invisible, intangible. I bless you with all spiritual gifts in heavenly places. For his force says he has chosen them in him. When did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. We can make more sense of that later, right? So he says here, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after they have erred from the fate, uh huh. Listen, and pierce themselves through with arrows. You hear that? Jesus says, when they take my free gifts and the gospel and merchandise it, listen to the analogy. He says, like they're taking arrows and spears and stabbing themselves with it. You listen to the scriptures. Look, look at the visual Jesus is giving. He said, you're stabbing yourself. You're charging the people of God and stabbing yourself. This is the analogy he's giving. L listen, listen to verse 11. Listen to verse 11. Right? Check this out. Where are we now? Verse 11 here, and I love it. Verse 11 of First Timothy 6 says, But thou, O man of God, He's talking to you, Kevin. He's talking to you, Pastor. He's talking to you, Apostle. All of you who decided, I'm not taking that route. I got to stand before the Almighty one day. Yeah, I'm being blessed with a lot of cars and houses, and I live in, like we say in the Bahamas, high off the hog. Yeah, we're doing that now, but there's a reckoning day coming. Don't mind these clowns over here, Robin, have no conscience. They are not, their conscience are now said. The Bible speaks of them having a reprobate mind. They have no fear for God. They, have, they could just offer whim, God say right now, $2 million. I don't know who you are. Come with your $2 million right now. They don't care about your family. They don't care, but they want you. If you have to go and steal it, go get it. They're, so they're trying to build edifice, telling the people, go to the bank and borrow the money. When the, when the words say, you should owe no man nothing except love. But of course, they have authorized themselves in a little federation, in a little conglomerate foolishness and they have now figured that they are their own consul and they could usurp the authority of the scriptures. So they encourage their members by telling lying stories about some other member who sacrifice and, and give all a kidney to build the church and give all a kidney to buy the church bus. God never asked you to give no kidney for a church bus. God never asked you to give no heart, nothing. Why are we running away from the scriptures? Why can't you give us the examples of the scriptures? as opposed to your fallacies and fantasies and the storytelling that you emit from the pulpit. People wake up, man. We can't, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot go any further with this mess. Verse 12 of 1 Timothy 6 says, But thou, O man of God, I'm warning you, those of you who truly believe the word of God, do not be tempted by these pulpit bandits. Do not be tempted by these casino prophets. Do not be tempted by these consistent, perpetual, endless seed beggars. It's never enough for them. Never. Every time the church, they beg and beg and there's never enough. But nobody's being healed. Nobody's being delivered. Nobody's being set free. Divorces are at a record high, particularly in the church. You might as well go back in the world. At least you could have some fun and you don't got a fake. Because we ain't seen nothing happening here. After millions of dollars, you would have pillaged and robbed us of. But thou, O man of God, flee. Listen to what he say. Run. Run from these things. Wherever you see them begging you for money over and over, there are no signs. There's no wonders. There's no deliverance. He says, run. He says, flee these things. Listen, listen. And follow after righteousness. What did I tell you righteousness is? Righteousness is God's way 
of doing things. I never sent them to invoice you, never. I never told them to put a price on the miracle, a price on the prophecy. I never, want, could you please look at my son Jesus, who left a blueprint, a template in place. It is your responsibility as a child of God to work out your own salvation. You could never say Kevin didn't read the Bible to me. You could never say apostle so and so. It wasn't their job to read no Bible to you. You, you must read that Bible for yourself. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Of course, all of this is a foreign language to the seed beggars. I love the story about Abraham. When Abraham had, by the assistance of God, delivered the almost 300 million Hebrew people out of Egyptian bondage, and God closed the Red, the, the sea, the Red sea on the Egyptian pharaohs, Pharaoh and his crew, and made them debt free after what they would have borrowed from the Egyptians, right? But this is what I like. The Bible says that when he got into the wilderness and he was commissioned by God, excuse me, to build the tabernacle, he told the people what he wanted to do. And the people gave, gave of all of the gold and stuff that they had. In fact, they will give, now, now, now listen, listen the heart of God here. Listen someone who's truly operating according to righteousness. The Bible says that the people were so uh, uh, overwhelmed and so happy to give to Moses to construct the temple. And clearly because of what they have seen God done for them. They, they have seen and witnessed the miracle of not only the, the 12, the, the plague, sorry, not only the plagues, but the actual deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And they watch God part, watch God part the ocean for them to walk on dry. And they watch God collapse that ocean on their enemies. So they would have seen tangible evidence. So much so that when Moses says, listen, we're getting ready to do God work in Billy's temple. The Bible said the people gave like nobody business, but this is the part of that story I love. That's why I have no respect, period, for seed constant beggars. The Bible says Moses tell the people, no, 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 stop now. That's too much. We got enough now. We got enough. I have never heard a preacher in my 51 years of living say to the people, we ain't collecting no offering today. We got enough in the bank. We probably do it the next week, week. Never in my life. Now, maybe you have. And whoever you are, please send me an email, please, because I will contact that church to congratulate them that they are not a part of the rest. The Bible says that Moses said to the people, okay, that's enough. We, we, we got more than enough to build here, man. Come on. That's, he could have been a hog like most of them. He could have been a, 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 a pulpit bandit like most of them. He could have been a seed beggar like most of them. He could have been consciousless. He could have been sad from the heart. He could have been a reprobate and make up stories and say, I hear God. 2004. No, all he said, listen. God has commissioned me to build his building. And the Bible says the people gave until he, Moses the leader, said to them, that's enough. We don't need no more. See, that's a person who have a heart for God. That's a person who's not selfish and greedy. That's a person who truly focus on, I, I'm building this for God, not for me. This isn't my edifice. What do we hear now? My vision. I want to leave a legacy. Man, go sit, go sit down, yeah? Talking nonsense. When we go focus on God. So watch this now. He said, man of God, 1 Timothy 6 verse 11, flee these things. What things are you talking about? Well, the things of verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And many, many of the body of Christ have covered and run behind it, causing them to error and just going away from the faith altogether, going in a opposite direction. They are now led and mesmerized by mammon. 
winning souls as you ain't here but none of that they ain't none of that they ain't none of that. everything is about we need to raise money raise money there's no end to it that is not of god right now let's let's look at another scripture let's go to luke let's go to luke chapter 10 all right luke chapter 10 and we're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 20, all right? After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. So aside from the 12 that Jesus had as his disciples, he had appointed another 70, okay, to go out and do what he's about to say right now. After these things, Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after these things, the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, appointed other 70 also and sent them to and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So the Bible says that he's now commissioned them two by two, 17 total, to go into various cities that he will eventually come, right? So verse two of, the, of Luke 10 says, therefore said he unto them, the harvest, this is Jesus speaking, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of people out there. There are a lot of souls to be won. There are a lot of them who want to turn their lives around. But there are few laborers or there are very, there are few real and true and genuine men and women of God that truly have a passion for the soul of the people, who truly have pain in their heart to see people walking on the wrong path or under ministries that are going against the word of God. He says there are few of those who truly, truly labor so there to bring in this big harvest. Watch this. Verse 2 again of Luke 10. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray, he says, ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Listen, he's giving them a command. Behold, I send you forth as lambs, among wolves i'm sending you forward as lambs among wolves but if you want to be honest that kind of switch now because a lot of them who's aired from the freight from the fate are now wolves along uh, among lambs okay but we ain't going to today first four of luke 10. listen what jesus said because he's telling them where not to put your priorities remember i just read for you coming off the heels of first timothy 6 verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, and those some of those who are the part of the body of Christ covet and lust after that, and as a result of that, cause them to err from the faith, right? So Jesus now is about to tell them, I am sending you out here, I've already equipped you, I'm sending and I'm telling you what to do, right? Now listen to what he says here, verse 4. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. So meaning that don't be dependent on funds, and what do you eat and what's going to happen? If I, God, send you, I have equipped you for the journey. I've already give you, given you your spiritual endowment to heal the sick and all manner of diseases, right? Verse 5 of Luke 10 says, And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire, okay? Go not from house to house. Now, listen to verse 7 again, because I can hear the demons out there now, right? Luke 10 verse 7 says, And in the same house, Jesus is speaking, remain eating and drinking such things, listen, listen, as they give. Uh-huh. Why? For the laborer, you the preacher, you are worthy of your hire. So what are you saying? He didn't say what the laborers demanded. No. He said, go there because God is going to touch their heart to give you. I am going to move on them to bless you with food and the resources that you need. You don't have to lie and say, God just told me he wanted to heal you, but that can cost you at least $9.7 trillion right now. It ain't me. It's God saying this. So he's making it clear. Yes, you are worthy of your hire, but it is not for you to demand how much you want to be paid? I will put it in their heart to bless you. Some of them, I might not even have them give you anything. But you got to trust me, Jesus, and not looking at mammon. 
Oh, I'm trying to help somebody today. I'm trying to help you today. Watch this now, verse 10. 8. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are sent before you. Listen, verse 9. Now, and heal the sick. No conditions. He didn't say, now only heal them if they offer you something. He, we did not read that, right? See, we got to be specific. We got to be analytical when it comes to these scriptures because there are too many people with their stupid rhymes and foolishness from pulpits talking dung and mess. We have to analytically see what our leader expects from us. This is the expectation from Jesus Christ that we should, should perform. He says now in verse 9, And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, Listen, the kingdom of God has come close unto you. Meaning, prepare. We're healing you now, but prepare because Jesus is coming here. Because you know in verse 1 he said, Listen, I am anointing you 70 to go two by two, and you are now going to precede me. You're going to go ahead of me. But letting them know that the kingdom of God is on the way, which is Jesus Christ. All right? So Jesus now is telling them in verse 9, he says, Now heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But into whatever city you enter, and they receive you not. Listen, listen what he says. Go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come unto you. So you can't say the kingdom of God wasn't here. We were here, but you rejected us. Verse 12, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they have a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 14. But it shall be more tolerable on Tyre and Sidon on the judgment than for you. Wow. Verse 15 of Luke 10. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth, listen, verse 16 of Luke 10. He that heareth, you heareth me, which is Jesus, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. But what does that mean? Kevin, when you are ministering this word in detail, and you are going against the grain, you are telling the people, stop sowing to these liars for healing. Stop sowing to them for prosperity. Stop sowing money for a husband and for a wife and for a promotion. Jesus says, now Kevin, they're coming for you now. Make no mistake about it. They can come, okay? But Kevin, be clear now. While they think they're coming for you, the truth is, they're saying your word like you've been telling them all along. They're coming after Jesus. They're saying, yeah, Jesus, what do you think this is? All this good uh, gospel we can preach these people for free? Never. We charge them. So they're coming after Kevin. So they're going to send out their cronies, and they're going to send out their worshipers, okay? And they're going to post little stupid stuff on Facebook, Twitter, and troll little jazz and shade here and there. See, unlike them, I come out front, okay, <laughs> and make the case clear based on the scriptures, all right? I ain't hiding behind no rock and hiding behind fake profiles. I show my face and everything. It's me who's saying it. Okay, now I never call no name, never. And that's what I love about the scriptures. Because you see, the scriptures are so hot. It's it burning their backside so bad that they jump up and defend it. Okay, now as you were talking to, I didn't know who you were before, but the word had put some heat on you. And now you're jumping to defend your lies. Mighty God, I, I hope you are not saved, sir. You, you are not saved, ma'am. Go get saved. Go get saved. You hear what the scripture says? It will be more tolerable for Tyree and Sidon than it will be for you. Mighty God. You all listening to this? You all hearing this? This is scripture. So Jesus made it clear to the disciples, don't, don't, do not take it personal. Then, because some, trust me, a whole, because they got a whole group there, they can come, but don't take it personal. They're coming after the word. They want you shut up. They don't want you telling the people the truth. They want the people be ignorant. They want the people submit to them. They want the people uh, be under their, their devil covering. They want all this garbage that Jesus never did. They want more respect to them and honor to them than Jesus ever required. You all hear this? You all see this? Mighty God. 
So verse 16 says, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Mm -mm. I tell you, I had a straight note. Somebody one time, come talk and mess to me. I out by the beach flying my drone. Okay, relax it. Don't harass his brother when he's flying his drone. All right? And this person come talk, mess in my ears, but they heard my show and there's some things they didn't agree with. Oh, hold on, let me land this drone. Let me let me straighten you out. So I had to land this drone, right? I said, now hold on, hold on, sweetie. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What you mean you didn't agree with me? Make, make, make that clear to me. Because you're interrupting my drone time. What do you mean? Well, there's some stuff that you that some stuff that I say, and where am I getting it from? Well, I will agree you get it. Well, you should shut up right now. We'll be going any further for if I discuss the Bible. I didn't trick them. I didn't throw. I didn't say nothing about giving me seed. I did none of that. I said this is what the scriptures say. I know you're mad because you're here otherwise. But this is what the scriptures say. So when you say you didn't agree, what you meant was you didn't agree with the word of God. Now, let me resume my drone flying, please. <laughs> talking mess. Get out here, get saved, except the Holy Spirit talking nonsense. So, you got to set them straight, because Kevin don't play. Stay in your corner. If you disagree with God, not me, stay in your corner. Go on your platform and preach another Jesus like you've been doing. But don't come here, because I will set you straight, all right? So, Jesus said in verse 16, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth Despising me is despising the one that sent me. See, people don't understand the spiritual magnitude of when they're rejecting the word of God from someone who they don't like. That is not you. You you you're gonna reject God's word because it's coming from someone you despise, someone you you like. The devil is using you. Verse seventy says, and the seventy return again, rejoicing, Lord, even the devils. Listen, even the devils are subject unto us. Through what? Through what? Through apostle name? No. Through prophetess name? No. Through bishop name? No. Through Kevin name? No. Whose name are the devil subject to when the 70 who was ordained by Christ? Who? who? Jesus Christ. That's the name. Why? Because he's the word made flesh. Why? Because he's the word that was sent to heal him. Why? Revelation 19 verse 13. Jesus Christ, the name, the word of God. That is what devils bow to. Healing come as a result of Jesus Christ, the word of God, not money. Let me read this again, because maybe it's different in my Bible. The guy said, and the 70 return again, verse 17 of Luke 10. And the 70 return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through our name. No, 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 no. All of this is happening because of the power that Jesus gave you. I like this piece, though. And Jesus is going to speak now. And he said unto them, I beheld or saw Satan as lightning fall from the heaven. Verse 19. Behold, I give, I like this. Behold, he's now reiterating something that he said earlier in Matthew 10, verse 1. He says now, he's talking to those who, who believe and receive them now. Behold, I've given unto you power to thread, uh-huh, on serpents, uh-huh, and scorpions. Now, let me put a pen in here because, of course, Jesus never gave us no power to go there in the bush and in the desert and look for snakes and scorpions and say, hey, come here, in the name of Jesus, die right now. And the snakes just started fluttering. No, 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 no. See, snakes, and if those of you who follow my dream interpretation teachings, you would understand what this means. The snakes and scorpions that he speaks here are just symbolic of spiritual evil deities. And the snakes and the scorpions are the high level forces of evil. So he's saying, I've given you power over the greatest forces of evil. So watch what he says in verse 19. We all have given unto you power. So you shouldn't be shocked that when you come against an unclean spirit, they bowed in the name of Jesus or they bowed via the authority that has sent you. We all have given you power to thread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Now, that's what I like now. He says, don't, don't, don't trip now. Don't act crazy. Don't become, don't become beside yourself. Now, why is he giving him this stern warning? Well, if you go back earlier to what I said, remember it says in, in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, he said that for the love of money is the root of all evil, okay? And he's warning them that there are people who was a part of this faith that left the faith because they, they love money more than the word of God, okay? Then we would have read in Mark, Matthew 
chapter 10, verse 8, where he gives them a stern warning. He says, freely I have given you this gift. Now you freely go there and heal these people. So he's warning them. So now in verse 20 of Luke 10, after all of what he's said, he said, now look here. Rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you. Don't trip over that because number one, that ain't you doing it. It is the power that I've given you to do that by yourself. You could never do that. He says, what you should be rejoicing over though, listen, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Mm. I sit back and I thought about that, right? I sit back and I thought about that. I say, now hold on, boy. I never been this, this route in my mind. For him to say that, so that means there are some who are going to be able to do some healing, but their names are not written in the book of life. But Lord, what is this? You all hear this? Okay, but what do you mean by that? Goes right back to what I said. I think it's first or second Corinthians 11 somewhere. It says the gifts of God are without repentance. So yes, some were able to heal by their gift and as well as some as were able to stage healings to make it look like that but they agreement with the perpetrator who they're dealing with to fool the public. But listen to what Jesus said here. I love this so much. He says, be happy that your names are written in heaven that's what's important do not become fascinated by the gift do not merchandise the gift there are people who are in hellfire preachers are talking about now preachers who are in hellfire right now okay right now suffering eternal damnation okay why Kevin because there are people during their tenure on this earth that God has given them the anointing to heal at those people but they never did it why because the people didn't have sufficient funds to meet the request of that preacher. And that's why I said to you, I made a vow to God years ago. And all of this was because of what I saw over my time of being in, in ministry and so on. And I saw a, a, another side of ministry. What, what people see on the outside, God, Jesus, say hallelujah, give a neighbor high five. It has been my experience that that's all pump and pageantry. But behind the scenes is this major business of merchandising the gospel. And that always irritated me. And as a result of that, I made a vow. I said, Lord, when you move me in the ministry, when you take me to wherever you're going to take me, I will make it clear right now. I will never beg your people for seed. I will never ask them for money. I will never merchandise my gift. I will never put an invoice to anybody, anyone who invite Kevin Ewing to come and minister the word of God and the Lord has led me or proved me to go, I will never tell them, okay, I charge 10,000, I charge for no human being. And I've traveled the length and breadth of this world doing ministry. I, a, I will never ask no one to come on their pulpit, which I have never done. I will never beg them to bring me on, but none of that. And I will never ask them for money. It has nothing to be with being to do with being noble. It has nothing to try to act like I'm different from the rest. I am different in the sense that I believe with all my heart that if I carry out the mandate that God has given me, which I'm doing now and on many other platforms, and I have seen it, and I am living it, and I've shared it with others, and they are doing it, and they are seeing the same thing, God will supersede whatever you could have give as a price for whatever they were requiring you to do. There are times I come here to doubt, I told you this before, to pay my bill, okay? To pay my bill, every uh, first of the month I come to pay my bill, for the most part, the bill is already paid. Oh, what is this? Mr. Ewing, all you got here is credit. People been in here and, 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 and come pay something on your bill here for you, and this one pay. One time I came here, I had over $1,500 worth of credit, but I've never asked nobody for a dollar. Never said to them, sow a seed into this hot anointed oil, this hot anointed tea. Never! Why am I telling you this? Am I telling you this to brag? Yes, to brag on Jesus Christ. Am I telling you to brag about the, telling you this to brag about the goodness of God? Yes. So no preacher, no apostle, I don't care what they call themselves, I don't care what their position is in the body of Christ or in the world. I will stick to the belief. I will die with this that if you do what you are called to do, the, the God of Abraham, the God of Daniel, the God of Isaac, the God of Moses will see to it that the provisions he has already put in you before you even started your journey, 
You will receive them in the right season. Why? Because your, your heart is focused on winning souls. Your heart is focused on bringing deliverance. Your heart is seeing the, the captives set free. Never. You will never ever in this life, the day you hear somebody say, Kevin on the radio, Kevin on YouTube, Kevin on Facebook begging for seeing. Well, I don't know who Kevin is, but it is not Kevin L.A. Ewing, Margaret Child. It ain't him. I have vowed my Savior. I have vowed God I will never, and I will make it public. I will never on this in this life beg the people of God whom God has already commissioned all over the world to bless Kevin. I will never put no demand on them and tell them lie. Never. No matter what I'm doing, I will never tell them. I, will, I hope you all record me because I want you to bring this as proof. Never. Because I believe the scriptures. I believe the word of God. That's why I find it so juicy, so sweet, because I have seen the word of God every time God came true for Kevin. It was always beyond my greatest expectation. When I was just trying to make the ends meet, he come and boom, knock the bell out. And you tell me, I can demonstrate a lack of faith by not having faith and patience to wait on my God to put a, an invoice to his people? It will never, 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 never in this life happen. Never. There are ministries that I've been to, there are people. Uh, there was a, a recent uh, prophetess lady. I'm not going to call her name, but I'm sure she's listening to me right now. And this lady, this lady, and one day I'm going to literally tell her why my wife and I did what we did recently to her. This lady gave a prophecy over my life. Okay? The prophecy was so detailed. I can tell her one day. So she had no knowledge. She had no knowledge of what I was dealing with. No knowledge of what Deidre and I had planned. No knowledge of this particular sheet. None of it. The lady went not only tell me what it is that we were doing, but the woman went in detail all the way down to what Deidre would be doing. Never discuss this with no one. You see, and what God did, God say, listen, call her right now and fix that. Why am I telling you this? She never once asked me for a seed. She never said, Minister, you ain't listen, ah, now you know you gotta, ah, come on now, that little thing, you gotta come up. Never, never, never. So what am I saying to you? When you do what you are called to do, with the idea that God is going to pay you, trust me, those resources will come from places that you would have never expected it. So no robbing preacher, no seed begging pastor, no pulpit bandit, no casino prophet could ever convince this young man, this 51-year-old, 52 come September, God spares my life, they could never convince me. Never but plant seed in this anointing. Plant seed in what ground? Get out of here, you thief. Get out of here, you liar. That will never happen. And I'm trying to encourage people today to excel in life. You want to be healed? You want to be delivered from the demons? Well, God has anointed men and women specifically to deal with your circumstances. But it will never come by giving them money. It will never happen. Now, if you like contributing to these endless money pits, well, you go right ahead. And looking for a miracle, well, you go right ahead. You go right ahead because it will never, never in this life happen. All right? Now, watch this. Let's go now to why. Why none of these so-called, uh, these things you're paying for are not coming to pass. Okay? Let's go now to Mark chapter 7. Let's go to Mark 7. Okay? I'll give you a good time. Let's go to Mark 7. Mark 7. Mark 7. And we're going to begin... Uh, from verse 15, all right? Mark 7, verse 15. What does it say? There is nothing from uh, without... Let me get this right. No. Sorry. Let's go to Mark 1. <coughs> Sorry. Go to Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Okay? And we're going to read on a bit of verse 13. Okay? Then came together unto him the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes. Now, these were the leaders of the temple. And of course, the priests back then 
was the ones who uh, took care of the things of God. Because remember, the tribe of Levi were to have no, excuse me, land in the promised land. Once they would have migrated from uh, wherever they were into Canaan, which is now Israel today. And the Levitical uh, covenant that God made with Israel, he said, listen, he said, uh, the 11 tribes other than Levi, he said, the law here, now this is the law, uh, the law of tithing, which you will find in uh, Exodus chapter, or oh, is he eluding me right now? But anyway, it's in Exodus, I can't remember, I'll probably remember later on. But the confirmation of the law of tithing is also found in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, where that the only human beings on this earth that could receive tithe legally, not what, like I gave you the example that I started out, not by tradition, hey, bring the tithes and offer, no, no you, you, the Bible never told the New Testament church to pay tithe. The tithe, very clear, which when it became a law, it never was a law in the time of Abraham, when Abraham gave to Melchizedek. It never was a law when Abraham, when, uh, what's his name? When uh, Jacob said, promised the Lord after the dream that if you bless me with what you said, I'll give you a tithe or 10% of everything that I'll ever take in. They were never, never a law for tithing. The law of tithing, as clearly stated, came about in Exodus as they were getting the rules and regulations to go into the promised land. Moses, as inspired by God, said to them, listen what he said, he says, okay, the Levitical tribe will be the only tribe by law, the Levitical priest that is, to receive tithe of their brethren. This is by law, go read it, Hebrews 7 verse 5. No other human, no other pastor, no apostle, no bishop, none of them are commanded by law to receive tithe. For those of you who are hearing this for the first time, you can go on YouTube and just type in the tithes was a law for who? By Kevin L. Ewing. I have a five-part series where I go into detail of what the scripture says, not what man would say. So the law of tithing. So in, in this story here, the Pharisees and all of these leaders of the temple, the tribe of Israel, the 11, was supposed to come and pay tithe, not a pastor. Because the law is very clear. And the Levitical priesthood is not a title. It's a blood lineage. Because a part of being a Levitical priest, you have to come, according to the rules, come through the lineage of Aaron. You know, Aaron was the brother of Moses. He was also the brother of, of, of Miriam, his sister, right? So the rules were you had to come through that lineage to be a priest. So no pastor, no apostle, no preacher could say, ah, bring your tithe to me because I'm the pastor. No, show me the scripture because I can show you a scripture that says it was commanded by law, Hebrews 7 verse 5, that the sons of Levi will demand tithe from their brethren. Who was the brethren? The, uh, the, the, the additional 11 tribes of, of Israel. But again, go read, go watch the video, you will see it, all right? So when it come now down to, of course, you know, the national anthem every uh, Sunday, uh, Malachi 3, verses, I think, 6 to 10, or whatever. Oh, bring you in the tithes. Oh, you curse for the curse. That's not true. That's all lies. You are not cursed if you don't pay tithes. It's a lie. Because we go back. See, don't give me a piece of a scripture. I ain't stupid. Let's go back. Let's get the full context. Malachi chapter 2, he says, Oh, ye priests. Very clear who he's speaking to as we now proceed into the other scriptures. Oh, ye priests, listen, listen, this commandment is unto you, not the New Testament church. It is for those who are under the Levitical priesthood. It was for the commonwealth of Israel, the tithing system, that no one will go hungry, no one will be suffering. But that's a whole new story. I ain't even going today. So back here to Mark 7 now, it says, Then came together unto him, which is Jesus the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of the disciples eating bread with the file, this is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. So the disciples are now, uh, just, and I'm bringing this story to show you the, the foolishness, which is very much relative, the foolishness today in churches in terms of seed begging, and you're going to see the, the, the comparison right here. 
So the, the, the Pharisees are saying, uh, we've been watching you, Mr. Jesus, and we see that uh, you're, you're violating the, the policies of the, the, the temple, the synagogue. And you notice that me and my crew here, you notice that we wash down our fingernails, we scrub our knuckles, we wash all the palm of our hands because it is by tradition that we're going to break bread, uh, that it is, it is basically holy to do that, even though the Torah never said that. They're inserting their own rules like they're doing today. Watch this now. Verse 2, And when they saw some of the disciples eating bread and defiling themselves as to say they're washing with unwashed hands, they found fault with Jesus. Verse 3 of Mark 7, it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not. Listen, listen, listen. Why were they doing this? Because they were holding the traditions of the elders. And what is a tradition? Some form of culture or behavior or pattern that was passed down from generation to generation. This have no scriptural base in this regard I'm talking about. All right? So here it is now. You're seeing where they have already slipped in. They're now putting tradition. It is tradition that we beg you for seed. It is tradition that we say we hear God for a thousand, hear God for five hundred. It is tradition that God say, if you don't bring the money right now, he's going to curse you. Tradition, nothing scriptural about it. So watch this. Verse 4, and when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, uh, brazen vessels, and of tables. So these are all the traditions that they included in the church. This had nothing to do with the Torah. This had nothing to do with the five books of Moses. Nothing. There is no scripture in there to say, if you don't wash your hand and wash the cups, you're an evil, you're defiled, none of that. But this is what they introduced, and now the people of the church were doing it. And just like today, if you tell them you are evil by begging these people for money, because what you're doing to them is you're causing them to trust in the money and not trust in the word of God. And they said, no, 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 no. We did this all our time. Remember I told you the story? The fellow says, hey, the woman says, the judge says, who gave you authority to go on these people properly to demand their books? What did we say? We always do it this way. In other words, this is our tradition. But the judge says, but this is not the law. This is not the law that has come from a higher authority. Will you get off? bullying people, lying to them, threatening them, scaring them to feed your greed under the guise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Try that. So he says here in verse 6, he says, He answered and said unto them, Jesus now speaking to them, Well, well said Isaiah the prophet, you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So listen to this. Okay, come on, man. come on, choir. Let me hear Jesus is a deliverer. Jesus is mine. Everybody jumping up, everybody pumping and shaking about and doing the Batusi and doing the cabbage patch and all of the crib walk and doing all the smoke and all the bump, all that, right? And every damn music just going, going. Jesus is my deliverer. Come on, I know he did. Ba, 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 ba. Just, just carry on, right? Ah, uh, let's slow down a little bit now. I hear God say now, come on now. I know some of you now, you're going to be challenged by what the man of God is about to say right now, glory be to God. But God is saying, give up your best. Right? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let's go back to scripture. Because that ain't going to work no more. Jesus said, while they're in here dancing, while they're in here putting on this performance, while they're abiding to and subscribing to every rule, except the written rules of the law, listen what Jesus is saying is happening behind the scenes. Verse 6 of Mark 7, He being Jesus answered and said unto them, Well said Isaiah when he prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, meaning that this was recorded before time, that you all crooks would have been doing this. The people, listen, Honor me with their lips. Jesus is my deliverer. And all of the nice fancy music. Listen, listen. But let's look at what Jesus really is observing. They honor me with their lips. Uh-huh. But their heart. Listen to this carefully. Is far. He didn't say their heart is not with me. No, 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 no. 
He said, their heart is far from me. Whoa, 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 Jesus, now you messing me right up here. So you telling me all this prancing and sweating and running around the bench and somersault flipping, doing the worm and all this footage. You're telling me, Jesus, that you are recognizing none of this? All of this hours of begging, tree and four offering, I mean literally pillaging the people who have to deal with high inflation. These people have no hearts. Jesus, you're saying you have nothing to do with this? Well, let's read it again. He answered and said unto them, Well have Isaiah prophesied, meaning that this was spoken of way before it happening now. You hypocrites. And the word hypocrites mean that you're a stage actor. You're an actress. You say one thing, but do the next. You perform one way for me, but the minute I turn my back, you, you turn into the crook that you are. This is what Jesus is saying. Watch this now. He says, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 7. How be it in vain, or however in vain, do they worship me? What is he saying, Kevin? What he's saying, to interpret it, he says, I'm not recognizing any of the seed begging. I'm not recognizing any of this sow a seed into this anointing, sow a seed into this good ground. None of this I'm recognizing because this is not what I gave you the power for. I never charge you. Why are you charging them? How be it in vain do they worship me? Teaching, listen, teaching for doctrine, seed sowing devil doctrine, seed sowing devil doctrine. How be it in vain? They're doing this in vain. What vain mean? Mean it will have no result. It will have no value. Now it's making sense. You've been sowing seed for years, and every year, this is your year. This is your season. Glory to God. I see God turning that thing, because they don't know what it is, he's turning that thing around, mm -hmm. and I hear in 1,765 days, God is going to move that thorn out of your flesh. Glory to God. Mm. 1,365 days. Wow. If I calculate that right, I should be dead by then. So listen to what Jesus said. You're listening to what Jesus said. You're going to listen to Jesus, you know. Jesus said, I love this, how be it in vain, in vain, in vain. This has no value. This is, the, this is nothing. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching as a doctrine the commandments of men. What is the commandments of men? So a seed. I'm your covering. You cannot, you cannot, if you're under this ministry and you're not under this covering, you're going to perish. You're going to die. You're going to... Okay, pastor, that may be true. But if you're the one who the covering, who, who exercises the covering of us, then why are you in the hospital with COVID? Huh? Why do you have to airlift you over here? Huh? Why your family members dying and you walk them, you're covering stuff these people. People wake up. Wait, how much, how much longer are you going to fall for this mess? And finally put your faith in the true covering, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. He has sent his word to heal you. Revelation 19 verse 13 is clearly states Jesus Christ, who is known as the Word of God. When are you going to wake up? When are you how much more money are you gonna sow in vain? Like Jesus have said. Mighty God, Yo, boy, this, this is just too juicy. Y'all hear this? Jesus said, how be it in vain, what they're doing is fruitless. In so much word, you will never see receive a healing. You could never purchase a miracle. You could, Jesus said, whatever they are telling you outside of my word, as dead, the commandments of men, it's all in vain. You will never get a harvest. You will never get a yield. You will never get a return from the, 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 the investment you're about to make by giving these. Look, 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 look at it. Look at their churches. They've been building churches forever. Some of them stopped building at grass and tree root growing up in the place now. Why? Because it was done in vain. What they told you to sow, what they told you to give had nothing to do with Jesus, the word of God. You try that. You cannot merchandise or sell the word of God. No. Try that. No. Let's continue. Verse 8 says, For laying aside the commandments of God. That's what they did. 
They're not telling you, give to the poor, help the needy. They're not telling you according to, I think it's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. He says, listen, listen one of the rules. He says, forsake not mercy, neither true believers, but bind it about your neck, write it upon the table of your heart, and what's going to happen? And in so doing, what's going to happen, God? You will find favor and good understanding before God and man. But this clown over here is telling you, God says he, he, there's a spirit of favor out in the building tonight. And you have to sow for this favor. Oh, oh, I didn't read that hypocrite. I didn't read that pulpit bandit. I didn't read that casino prophet. I didn't read that seed beggar. Jesus said, even if they mad with you, the reality is they're mad with me. That's what I read. That's what I read. Jesus, tell me some more. I, I, I love this. Listen what he says. For laying aside, this is what they did. They lay aside the commandments of God. Man, you don't got to go to I don't listen to this big head, Kevin, big nose, Kevin. You don't listen to him. He's nothing but a hater. Get him from around here. Now you listen to us. Okay? You want to be prosperous, right? Okay, good. All right. All right. Now you got to come under our covering because you know that all the Superman powers, if you want a part of this, uh, a conclave you got going on here, then you susceptible to the elements, the elements of the, the, the wicked one. Forget what Jesus told you earlier in Mark 10, sorry, Matthew 10, verse 1. He says, I've given you power against what covering are you talking about? What it's so why are you such a liar? What covering are you the the power that Christ gave me? I saw no prerequisite that I have to be under this delusional covering you're talking about. What are you talking about? So you're telling me that I cannot attain none of these things Christ is giving us for free unless I come through your, your, your commandments, your fake gospel? Jesus made it clear. Listen to what he said. Listen to exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said here, right? How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And ye, verse 9 of Mark 7, and ye said unto them, full well, listen, fully well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. Boy, listen, when I tell you they hot right now, they hot. And you know why they really hot? To be honest with you, they hot right now because what we are reading here, not so much what I say because ain't like this my words. This is the actual word of God, which is Jesus the Christ. So when they tell you, jump all of these other hurdles outside of this, they're saying to you, forget Jesus, man. Don't mind Jesus. Jesus is taking you on these long trips. We got a way to take you there quicker. But you know ain't nothing in life for free. And you know it got to be costly. And we got to get paid first. And then you got to figure your way out after that. I mean, we, all we doing is collecting the toll free. And uh, whatever you do is on you. And whatever work out, that's on you. Now, let's put some disclaimers down. If it work, then that's our power. If it don't work, you didn't have enough faith. This is what the commandments of men will guide you to do. Watch this. Watch this. And he said unto them, verse 9, Full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. Never telling the people to have faith in the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. The word he sent to heal him, which is Jesus Christ. The word made flesh, which is Jesus Christ. Don't ever tell them about that. Don't ever tell them about salvation. Don't ever tell them about the healing, free gifts, and all the whatever powers. God, Jesus already, once you accept him, believe in him, boom, you have it. No hurdles to jump. You don't have to go to no preacher, no teacher, nobody. He says, I behold, I have given you power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the devil and nothing shall harm you. There's no way in the scriptures where there's no clauses, no article 1.624, none of that. Straight to the point. Jesus is like, yeah, this is how serious I am about you. Okay? I already know your path. I already know the plan I got for you. But you cannot go out there and do these things without my power. So I'm going to go ahead of the game and bless you now. I ain't going to wait for later. I ain't going to let you do stuff to prove to me you're worthy of the gift. No. I trust you. If you follow my rules, though, I trust in you now. Boom. The gift belongs to you. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to jump. You don't have to fast for it. You don't have to pray. You don't have to do none of that. You accept me, Lord and Savior. The word. When you believe the scriptures, you believe me, the word. Okay? As a result of that, behold, I've given you power. Okay? That's Luke 10, verse 19. 
Matthew 10 verse 1, what does it say? He says, I have given you power over unclean spirits, casting them out, so now you could do what? So you could heal all manner of diseases and all manner of sickness. People, maybe I'm stupid, maybe I'm ignorant. Did you see any prerequisites? Did you see any protocols that says, okay, now, first of all, you got to be a lay minister for 700 years, and then I have to, depending on how I feel or if I live, if I live, then I might make you this. So then you will maybe get peace of the power. No. Jesus is so interested in humanity and giving them a better life now and even in the life to come. He says, I'm going to jump ahead of the game and bless my leaders with the gift to pull you out of these pits that you're in. But instead, his leaders say, now, whoa, 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 whoa. You see how much these people respect me? You see how much they honor my robe? You see how much they like my velvet shoes? And now I got power to go down? Uh-uh, they're going to pay for this. That's what they're saying. And that's why they don't encourage you to read the scriptures or bring you to such scriptures that I show you. Because what I can do is that I preach on your ignorance. You are cursed with a curse if you don't pay tithe. You are cursed if you don't get lies. All lies. All lies. Lies. So listen to what Jesus said, verse 10 of Mark 7. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and who cursed thy father and mother, let him die the dead. This was the law of God back then in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it is. This is what Moses said. Jesus said, This is the law you should be followed. But watch how they twisted it, verse 11 of Mark 7. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corbin, which I told you what Corbin was. Corbin was. And again, these were all the commandments of men that the Pharisees, okay, the leaders of the temple who would have been the Levites, they now augmenting the laws of God. The Torah, they put in and taken away from it. So this is what they say now. You could curse your man, pa. In fact, you could commit adultery, lie, and do all of that. But we have a law called Corbin. And what Corbin means is that you could come to the secret part of the temple and make a donation that is not refundable. And as a result of that, we, the heads here, we forgive you of it. Boy, but God, God, we too harsh. We got this. That's what Corbin meant. So what they were saying, everything was to, we, we are your, and so much words, let me bring this baby home. We are your covering. We are the leaders of the temple, okay? And you can satisfy us, even though you violated the laws of God, you can satisfy us by giving your best seed. That's what they're saying. Because they are asking the one who cursed mommy and daddy, which the law states that, that that person should be put to death. So they say, no, 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 we're not putting this guy to death if he got the funds. Now, woe unto them who don't have the funds because they will have their head removed from their shoulders. Wow, you, you, all, you all see this? It is no different from the devil doctrine of seed sowing for miracles, for husband, for car, for promotion, is witchcraft. That's exactly what it is. I call it how I see it. I call it how I see it. So Jesus says here, Verse 11, but you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin that is, so, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Meaning, if you bring this gift, I will let you go. Verse 12, and ye suffer him no more, or you allow him no more to go or to his father or his mother. Making the, listen, because you're doing these things, you're making the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered. And many such are like you. So what is this? Let's sum all of this up. What is, what is he saying? He's saying, you, ma'am, you, sir, you who have the, uh, the sickness, you who should have been healed a long time ago, well, the reason, it isn't that Jesus is failing on his promise. No. He says, your tradition and those whom you've allowed to mislead you, it is the traditions of men that's causing the power of the word of God to have no right to have an effect in your life because you're subscribing to another gospel. You are subscribing to another Jesus. It is not the Jesus of the scriptures. It is another gospel. Very clear, very simple. So we ain't no use in us beating around this. Let's, 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 let's look at that. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a teaching, I don't remember the topic, and I'm saying to you, there is a satanic group, a, a, a cult actually, whom their leader, the name is Jesus. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's a gentleman out of Jamaica. Uh, he's on my page. Uh, Spiral, Spiral Lee, I can't remember the name. Anyway, he was a voodoo worker. He's now a pastor. And he was a part of this cult that's, that worshipped this Jesus. But it wasn't the Jesus, the Christ. 
right? So what I did though, I went and I did my own research in terms of from a scriptural perspective, right? And I went to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 to really confirm this. And listen what it says. But I fear, least by any means, this is Paul speaking, as the serpent beguiled Eve uh, through his craftiness, so your minds could be corrupt from the simplicity uh, that is in Christ. For, verse 4, for if he that cometh, listen, preach it another Jesus. Mm. Mm. I go on something about this. Time may not permit me, but I can try squeezing as much as I could. Because a lot of the false prophets you see on television, oh, Jesus' name, oh, Jesus, Jesus' name right now. And then people say, that's a false prophet. You know, look at what they do. They spray stuff in people's mouth. They don't everything except the Bible. They rarely quote scriptures. Everything as if it's coming from the man of God and not Jesus himself. But then the next person says, well, Kevin, no, 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 man. Kevin, I hear you, but listen. The Bible says, Kevin, you know, if they come in my name, and whose name again? Jesus? Well, the Bible is saying, yeah, the Bible is saying in 2 Corinthians 11 verse uh, 4. For if he that cometh, preaching another, but Kevin, how am I going to know it's another Jesus if he's saying Jesus like the fellow who's saying the real Jesus? Well, let's look at his behavior. What is his behavior? Let's quickly go here to Deuteronomy chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, because we're going to see how we assess these jokers now. Watch this now. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and give it thee a sign or a wonder, meaning that they're performing miracles and do not kind of razzle-dazzle, right? Verse 2 says, and the sign or the wonder which they did came to pass, right? Meaning that it actually happened the way they predicted it. Wherefore, he speak unto thee, saying, listen now, this is how you're going to compare what he is doing with another Jesus. The sign did come to pass. The prophecy did come to pass that he said. But watch what it says. Wherefore, he spoke unto thee, saying, this is, the, this, this is what he's telling you now after the happened. Let us go after other gods, small g. And another, in other words, let us go after another Jesus. Because what the scriptures are showing us that the miracle that came to pass, that he, or the prophecy that came to pass, the place he's now telling you which you ought to serve and source, which is not the God of Abraham, that is where he's getting his power from. Have nothing, and have all of the, the, the outside uh, pageantry stuff of Jesus and if you do not read the scriptures if you do not believe scriptures over man no matter how much it is your favorite preacher then you will be susceptible in being trapped into this nonsense so you must now line up who are they really serving well let's look at what they're doing they couldn't be serving the Jesus who we just read about in Matthew 10 verse 1 in uh, Luke 10 verse 19 in both cases we all are freely giving you power and in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 10, he says, Now do not, just how I give it to you freely, now you, you heal freely. So now, how they're serving another Jesus. They're saying to you that the same Jesus who tell us that we just read, Matthew 10 verse 8, the latter part. Jesus, you know, in, le in red letters, he says, I have given you these gifts freely. Matthew 10 verse 1. Now you go and you must heal people freely. But this clown is telling you now, no, this can cost you. God says he will heal you. There's the pain here with a pain in their left buttock. God says, if you make the sacrifice of $300 right now, that is another Jesus. Behold, I've given you freely, so why are you charging them? And I told you to give them freely. Okay, time going right now. Right? I got a lot of scriptures here, but I can go to this last one and bring this baby home, right? Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Got a lot more to deal with this next week. Acts chapter 8. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 24. We begin right here. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Okay, now I really want you to hear this. I've said the story before, but based on what we're dealing with today, you're going to see the more, more of a relevance of it as it relates. There are few of them. There are very few of them because it seems as if a lot of them now find it very difficult not to go on the money wagon. And it's and it's it's a great testament of where their faith is really located. So let's go to Acts chapter eight, beginning at verse nine. But there was a certain man called Simon, okay, which before time in the same city 
use sorcery or witchcraft, meaning that he manipulate people under uh, spiritual powers, okay? The Simon used sorcery. And what did he use it to do? He used it to bewitch the people of Samaria. So the people of Samaria was under a spiritual spell, meaning that they were demons that they could not see, assigned to, if not all of them, uh, imposing their will upon these people to do what they would normally do in normal circumstances, for the most part, to pay honor and homage, and homage to Simon the sorcerer, making him to be something that he's not. But they are demons that's convincing them to do this, just like a lot of churches who deals in the occult, but they make it seem as if it's a Jesus state. So, and how do you know this? Because the people worship the leaders as opposed to worshiping the God that the leaders claim to serve. Okay, so he's saying, the Bible is saying now, it is quite possible that the powers of darkness could be with your city. Now for this to happen, if you're not following me with notice, for this to happen, it speaks volumes about the city. They could not have been committed to God. Hence why Paul those came there. So let's, let's listen to the story. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city, in the same city used witchcraft or sorcery, and bewitched the people, or he had them under spell, the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. And this was because of the tricks he was doing and performing. To whom they all gave heed or homage from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God based on the tricks he was doing, right? He had them all under spell. Just like most people today under most churches, they are under a spell that have nothing to do with God. They are under a spell serving another Jesus, but not the Jesus, who is the word, which is the second witness that bear witness in heaven. Verse 11 of Acts 8 says, And to him they had regard unto who? Simon of Samaria. The people of Samaria had great regard because that of a long time he had listened, is saying again, bewitch. This is a cult term. It means to put a spell on a person. And all it means is that there's a spirit assigned to the person coercing their spirit and their will to conform to the spirit will. Whether it's a spirit of lying, whether it's a spirit of immorality, whether it's a spirit of sickness, it all a spell means that we would have performed a prescribed ritual by this particular altar. We were told to bring uh, some alcohol, bring a specific candle, bring some certain plants, because that is what this spirit requires at this altar for us to invite it to this realm to now do our bidding over innocent people who would never know. Okay? That's all that spell me. Watch this now. It says here in verse 11, And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorcery or witchcraft. Verse 12 of Acts 8, But when they believe Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ and were baptized both men and women, then Simon himself believed also. Now clearly he realized that as wicked as he was and as much evil power as he had, there was a power greater than his sorcery because the people were now subscribing to uh, Philip and those, the gospel of Christ and the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And there were changes that clearly Simon saw. It, it, it moved him so much that he decided to come on board. Now, I want you to see a very important revelation here. And we're getting ready to wrap up here. Here's what I want you to see. You're going to see that people have different motives for coming into the kingdom of God. Not everybody who have the gift of teaching, the gift of preaching, and so on, and that charismatic gift, not all of them coming for real, genuine motives, such as I truly was out there. God saved my life. He protected me. I was I was not killed in a plane crash. I did not, the car accident should have taken me, it didn't happen. So I've dedicated my life to win souls to the kingdom of God. There are people out there who say, hmm, hmm, but this look very lucrative. And look how the people love pastors. They wow. All you gotta say is you're a pastor and you can get away with just anything in this world. Huh? You don't gotta preach the gospel, you can say what you want to say and still demand that they have a pastoral offering for your 10 minutes. Wow, I for this. So you see here, this is what's happening to Simon. Simon, yes, the Bible says he was converted, but the truth is he had an ulterior motive. And we're going to read it right now. So the Bible says here, verse 12 of Acts 8, but when 
they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon, who was the sorcerer himself, believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So the scripture didn't say he continued with them and was marveled over the preaching of the gospel, over the winning of souls. No, he looked at the results of what the power of God was doing. And he's now saying, man, I was in the wrong field of business. I should have stick with this here because this here seemed to be more powerful. So you see where his motives are now being brought to the surface. Watch this now. Verse 14 of Acts 8. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. So that means now the spell that, that this boy Simon had on them was broken. And this further convinced him like, wow, man, these fellas, bad. Why one piece of this? Because he's still thinking, as you're going to see later, from a monetary perspective, because that's what sorcerers do. And that's why I tell you, people who charging you for seed sowing, that came from an occult demonic background. Because anyone listening to me right now who have had any participation in witchcraft, no, you cannot go to an altar to summon the powers of an evil spirit without bringing money to that altar. So you see how this has infiltrated its way into the kingdom of God. But it's not a part of, the, of God, it's a tradition. It's a culture, it's a cult. Hence Jesus said, because of this tradition, you will never see this healing happen in your life. Never. If you're paying someone for healing, if you're purchasing oils and scarves for healing, you will never, because you are, you are polluting the, 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 the genuine protocol for healing. To try that. So listen to what he says here now. Verse 13, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Paul and wondered, marveled, behold, the miracle, building the miracles and signs which were done. Verse 14 of Acts 8, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Why? Because the harvest is great now. The laborers are few, so we've got to send in more laborers. Verse 15 of Acts 8. It says, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16 of Acts 8. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, meaning the Holy Spirit, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And when Simon, this is the same guy now, who was more interested in the results of the Holy Spirit, but not really the Holy Spirit, but from a different perspective as we're about to read. And when Simon, verse 18 of Acts 8, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Ghost was given, listen, listen, because now you're going to see why I call these people seed beggars, pulpit bandits, and casino. And I hope they are offended. I hope so to the extent they truly accept Jesus Christ. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Ghost was given to the people, he, who was he? Simon, mm -hmm. the one who claimed to believe Jesus. However, he was more in the results of what the power of God did as opposed to truly winning souls. He offered them money. Hmm. Hmm. Is the scripture suggesting that Simon of Samaria made an attempt, made an, made an attempt to purchase the power of God? To get a franchise of the Holy Spirit like most of them do today? Was Simon sowing a seed to get the power of, I don't see the difference. I don't, maybe someone could point it to be the difference. What is the difference back then than what you see today? He marveled at what the gifts were doing and he said, man, listen, the world where I come from, we could pay for this. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says, and he offered them money. Why would the Holy Spirit inspired man 
to include this in the scriptures because he know the seed beggars would be here today. He know that they would do everything to get you to focus more on the seed and make you believe it is the seed that's healing you. Because you sow the seed, you got a husband. You sure that was from God? Because you see the hell you catching now. You won't get out of this place. You actually told people, well, I sow the seed when prophet is telling me this. But look at the hell you catching now. The Bible says that the blessings of God are... Uh, the, the blessings of God, uh, I'm trying to remember it now. Added wealth and no sorrow, something of that. You all know what I mean. But anyway, so why is this quote unquote blessing you paid for, you sow the seed for, sleeping with everybody? They say, husband, now everybody except you. Having a baby with everybody except you, but you sow a seed for him. This woman who you sow the seed for, okay? Huh? Got all these Chinese children saying they're yours. Don't look nothing like you. Okay, this would God bless you with? Huh? This the blessings of God? With added wealth and no sorrow? What you reading your Bible backwards? Eh? You see, people, you got to wake up. You got to see, stop being blind to reality. And the reality is you saw, you, you participated in something that was tradition, in which the background of it was from a demonic perspective. Now you're getting the spawn or the seed of the devil and your shock. So that's what your seed brought you. You should have tried the word of God. But watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I love this. And when, verse 18, Acts 8, and when Simon saw that through having, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. I love this. Verse 19. He offered them money saying, listen, listen, he's off because this is exactly when someone tell you, sow seed for miracle, sow seed for healing, sow seed for whatever it is. That like, like we read earlier in Mark 7, they're putting aside the commandments of God only to usher in and to trump the word of God with the commandments of men or the traditions of men. And Jesus made it very clear in uh, Matthew 15, verse 5 and 6, and Mark 7, verse 13. Because of your tradition, because of this evil culture, because of this handing down of sowing seed to bring about the promises of God, the word of God will never manifest in your life. Now you see why you're not healed. So the Bible says here in verse 19, Simon saying, give me also this power that on whomever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon has converted the power and the gifting of God that it is to be generated by money, not by your faith, not by faith plus, plus works. You see why I keep telling you this? You see why I keep telling you any one of you that subscribe to seed sowing for miracles and for God to do things for you, what you are saying is forget faith. I believe the seed is going to do it. You're all about blowing these banner pawns and saying, listen, because I blow this, I can get healed. Because I put this scarf on my neck and put this cape over my head, you are a fool. Because at the end of the day, the scriptures are unequivocally clear. Who did the scripture say was the word of God? Jesus Christ. Who did the scripture says God sent his word, which is Jesus made flesh? Him. It is him. If you are believing for a house, you are believing for a promotion, you are believing for healing, it's your, your faith should never be in a seed unless the seed, according to Luke voice, chapter 8, verse 11, is the word of God. That's the only seed in this life or the life to come, in this physical or even spiritual realm. It is the only seed that could produce beyond what it's called to do. Example, an apple seed only could produce an apple tree. An orange tree, can only, an orange seed could only produce an orange tree. But the seed of the word of God could produce a house, a car, it could produce healing. Why? Because the seed is the word of God. Kevin, make me understand more. He says all things, Colossians chapter 1, was made for him, by him. And without him, who is him? The seed, according to Luke 8, 11. The word of God, according to uh, Revelation 19, verse 13. The word, according to Psalms 107, verse 20. First John 5 and 7. The second one that bears witness in heaven. Who is it again? The word of God. I love it. I love it. Talking mess. 
You will never, I, let me make it clear. You will never, never be healed from your sickness. Never be delivered from your diseases. If your confidence is in the rituals, the commandments, the voodoo of men. But if it's in the word of God, healing is the end. Listen to me, listen to me carefully. If your confidence is in the word of God, the Bible says, I think it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. He says, cast not away your confidence. What is he talking about? Do not toss away the word of God. Why? Because it will work for you. Me, what is it going to work for me? A great recompense of reward. Meaning that the return is going to be greater. My God, hey, put your confidence in Jesus. Put your confidence in the word of God. Speak it, decree it, proclaim it every day. Do what I used to do when I was going through my problems. I used to put it on the sticky pad, put it on my bathroom wall, put it on my, 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 my dashboard in my car. Whenever I turn, I will see the word. I will repeat the word. I will decree the word. The Bible says his word shall not return unto him void. The Bible says his place is word above his name. The Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one speck of the word of God shall not come to fruition. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God is pure and he is a shield unto those that put his trust in the word, not seed, not seed, not seed. They are liars. They are liars. Too long y'all been taking our money. Too long y'all been building your own kingdoms. Too long y'all trying to build your legacy off us. No, 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 no. Oh, we're not cursed, you're cursed. So I'm, we're leaving from underneath this cursed place. And we are now going after the word of God. No man, that's what I'm coming after. i coming after the word of the living God. I love it. And what does the word of the living God says according to Proverbs chapter 13? How powerful it is. He says, take fast hold of instructions. What is these instructions? The word of the living God. Why? Why should I take hold of these instructions? This is what it says. Let her not go. Keep her. Why? For she is thy life. What is my life? The word of the living God. That's my sustainer. That's what's going to heal me. That's what's going to deliver me. Let's look for some more proof over here. Let's go over to Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. My son, forget not my law, my commandments, my rules, my principles, my precepts, my ordinance. In summary, my word. Why? He says, but let her, let thine heart Keep my commandments. And what's going to happen if I actually subscribe to what you just told me as it relates to the word of God? Well, according to the fruit of that, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 2, he says, for length of days, long life. Now, the seed give you long life. The seed give you extra days. Show it to me in scripture. That's what I will see. Show it to me where you plant seed, where you took seed, and carry it to the church, and God says, hey, hey, you, come here, where are you going, come here, you just sold 500 hours, we can give you 20 more years for that, get out of here, you thief, get out of here, you liar, I love the word of God, because if you come challenging me, you better come with something that's going against this, or can refute this, or you, sorry, that can uh, trump this, get out of here, go get saved, go get saved, preacher, go get saved, you false prophet, go get saved, you casino high roller, get out of here, talking foolishness the bible says in verse 2 of Proverbs 3 for length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee why is this going to happen because i put my trust in seed no because i put my trust in shofar no because i put my trust in everything except the word of god no it's going to happen because i put my confidence where in the word of God. Now I'm going to end right here. I got a lot more, but I'm going to do this next week. So we're going to end right here because we're going to look at some more instructions and we finish. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 3, right? I love this piece right here. Let's continue. For length of days and long life, Proverbs 3 verse 2, shall they add unto thee. And they can give you peace. Not only will you have long life and length of days, but how are you going to notice this of God and not of the devil? Because peace is going to be attached to it. So I'm going to give you long life, but they're not going to be in misery. All right? Verse 3. He says, now, these are more instructions. This is the word. He says, now, Kevin, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Meaning that always be merciful to other people and always be honest and tell them the truth. Meaning, Kevin, I've given you a platform to teach my word. 
I've given you a gift to break it down that even a child can understand it. Kevin, do not lie to the people. Kevin, do not sell your gift. Kevin, do not tell them, hey, look, if they sow into this ministry, they can get gold teeth and jerry curl and weave. Don't tell them nonsense like that because it's lies. Tell them exactly what my words say. Now watch this. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them about the table of thy heart. Now what's going to happen, God? Verse 4. So shall thou find favor now. How I can get favor? Because I sow seed? No. I can get favor because... No, how I can get favor? Because I didn't forsake mercy and I didn't forsake truth. In fact, I did exactly what he said. I bind it upon my neck, write it upon the table of my heart. All that means is I kept it with me and actually did it. So faith with works will now manifest the promises of God. So he says, now favor is going to come to me. Listen to verse 5. Trust in the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. and all thy ways acknowledge him. Now what's, what's the result? I'm going to now direct your path, Kevin. Now I want us to drop to verse 9 and we finish. Okay, you all ready for this? I come in after the seed beggars. Let me put this mic down. I got something for you. I told you I bought my belt. I can whoop you silly right now. Listen to this carefully. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord. Listen, because you know who this month is, right? This first fruit month. Honor the Lord with thy substance. I can hear them out there right now. See that? See that? Give me, we need your first fruit. We want your whole paycheck. We don't care how much they raise uh, taxes and raise VAT. We want our money. Listen to these crooks. It says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruit of all thine increase. Okay, that's another promise. Now, what's going to happen in verse 10? He said, as a result of that, so shall thy bonds be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst with new wine. So God says, if you honor me with your substance, meaning that that would have caused you to, to be blessed with, and now give me the first of that, he says, if you do that, I will ensure that you will always have more than enough. So I could hear the, the casino prophets are there right now. I could hear the seed beggars and the pulpit bandits right now. Yeah, we got you now. You hear that? So you got to bring it to us, the pastors. Bring it to us first. Yes, a liar. Yes, a liar. We can prove you as a liar right now. Okay? Now, we are a New Testament church. And back then, the first fruit were to be given to, listen, not a pastor, not a prophet. The first fruit well, there are many rules for the first fruit, but in this regard, it's to be given to the priest. And that priest, there was only one type of priest, and that was the Levitical priest, whom a covenant was established with between the tribe of Levi and the 11 sibling tribes. All right? And the deal was you was to bring it to them, and that first fruit was the first of your agriculture. All right? But we ain't going to go there. We ain't going to get petty. Here's where I want to go. This is the New Testament church who was never a part of of the tithing system, which was to bring about a common wealth among all involved, which don't happen today because you pay your tithe and only those at the top get freed from it. Nobody else, they got to suffer and give. Anyway, we ain't going there today. That's another day. Here is where I'm going. This is the New Testament church. So how, how do we give our first fruit? Because all of the crooks out and you bring it to them in Jesus' name. Well, okay, let's see here now. Let's go. You all know where I'm going, right? Because we won't give first fruit, right? Meaning that, who do we give the first of our increase to? Okay, I'm going to give you two scriptures. The first one is in Luke chapter 14. I love this, beginning at verse 12. Because I want to see who I, because I, I don't give my first fruit a long time. Okay, and I can show you who I give it to. Verse 14, chapter, Luke 14, verse 12. Then said he, which is Jesus, also to him that uh, bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not your friends, don't call them, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor the rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and recompense thee. Meaning that whatever you do for them, they'll do for you, vice versa. They say, don't call these people. Okay, when you, when you have something you won't give away, listen to what he says, verse 13. But when you make a feast, okay, what you do? You call, who do you call first to give these first fruit? You give it to the poor. He said, you call the poor, that's who you give to, the maim, those who can't do nothing for themselves. That's who I gave my first fruit to. Oh yeah, January, this money, oh yeah, I've been given, 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 given to who? Church? No, pastor? No. Uh-uh, no, no, we've been given to y'all. My first will go to the poor. But Kevin, boy, I know but that one. you right, you know, because they don't, they don't teach you that. So let's back this baby up. Y'all know I gave it this, right? Matthew, it began right here. We finished right here. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, I so love it. Beginning at verse 31, because we want Kevin to prove to us that his first fruit, because he want healing, he want deliverance, he don't want to repeat that same cycle of foolishness. How is he going to make it different by doing the word of God? 
So Kevin, you just tell us, according to scripture, it was in your opinion, you said the first fruit go to the poor, because that's really giving it to, honoring Jesus is giving it to the poor. So prove it to us, okay? 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, that will be Jesus, and all the holy angels with him, as a shepherd, the sheep from the goat. Verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. All right? Then shall the king, now who is the king? We got to be clear here. The king here is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that when Jesus come back to earth, he's going to divide the nations, the sheep on his right and the goat on his left. Now he's going to define the sheep and the goat. Now remember, the closing of what we're doing right now is the first fruit. And the reason for this is because we want to be healed, we want to be delivered, we, want, we don't want to come circle this mountain of failure anymore. So we don't want to follow the charlatan way of telling you to bring money to no pastor, and money to no church. No scripture ever told you that. The scripture told you the Old Testament way, and now it's now telling you the New Testament way to do it. So, because we're going back here again to uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10. He says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and the first fruit of thine increase. How are we going to honor the Lord in the New Testament church? We're going to see it right now. Verse 34 of Matthew 25 says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, that will be the sheep. He said, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen what Jesus is saying to them, because this is Jesus speaking. Because Jesus, Jesus is now telling them what qualified them to be members of the kingdom of God that was prepared for them before the foundation of the world. So verse 35 of Matthew 25 says, For I, which is Jesus, was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Verse 37, okay? Then shall the righteous, which are the sheep, then shall the righteous, which are on his right hand, answer him, because they're confused, saying, now Jesus, we won't go to hell, but explain to us, when were you at these places when we were feeding the hungry, helping the poor, the maimed, and when did this happen? Because we remember the scripture in Luke 14, verses 12, where you, verse 13, where you said, when we give, the first people that we give to is supposed to be the poor, not the pastor, not the church, the poor, all right? So where were you in all of this? Listen to what Jesus is going to say here now. Jesus said in verse 38, he says, they says, when saw we thee as a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Verse 39, or when saw we when you were sick or in prison and then we came to visit you? We don't remember that. And the king, now who is the king? Because this is where the revelation is. The king is Jesus. Because now what we're seeking here is Jesus said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10, Honor the Lord with thy substance and the first fruit. Who are you going to give what God has blessed you with? Who you, who, how do you bless Jesus? Verse 40 of Matthew 25. And the king which is Jesus shall answer them who were inquiring, where were you when we were feeding the hungry, the sick, and so on? And he says, he will say unto them, Verily I which is Jesus say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the pastor, I didn't read that. As much as you have given to the church, I didn't read that. As much as you have given to whatever, I did not read that. What are you reading, Mr. Ewing? Because this ain't your Bible, you didn't write these scriptures. I am reading here, in verse 40 of Matthew 25, Jesus is now telling them how they qualified for the kingdom. And he gave them an outline for us, he said, when you was feeding the hungry, giving them water, giving them clothing, visiting them in prison, Jesus said, Verily I said unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Case closed. All y'all go to jail. Case closed. Jesus is making it very clear here. Listen to me carefully. I don't care what your tradition is. I don't care what your church does. I go in with the Bible because I am living it. And everybody who follow this pattern, am I saying don't give to your church? No. 
I am not saying no gift. In fact, you've been given to them. How much more? Just like with Moses. Moses said, that's enough now. Come on now. You're coming. We have enough. You will never hear that from them. So Jesus is now coming. And he's saying to them, he says, listen, if you want to give your first fruit, if you want to honor me, well, give it to the poor. Because whenever you give it to the poor, he made it very clear. You are giving it to Jesus. Jesus has made it unequivocally clear how we give to him. And he never said, Bring a hundred dollar seed, a thousand dollar seed to your pastor, put it on the offering, put it on the altar. He never said that. He gave specific in the same way. You could tell me that if I tell a story and the story is not true, the Bible says I told a lie. If you tell me, okay, if I have sex with someone that I'm not married to, that's fornication, all, all that is clear to you. But you become confused now when it's time to give to the poor, but the Bible is very clear. That's who you must give to first. And in doing so, giving to Jesus, all of a sudden, all of these uh, eloquent speeches you come up with, but get out of here. So, you know, Kevin gave us fruit too, as he has been given for the past 10 years. I go as I am led to the less fortunate, and we bless them abundantly to show Christ we honor you and thank you for what you have done for us throughout the past year that's what we did and just like every year before we have seen the harvest and guess what's happening i told you last year that this year 2022 september will make 10 solid years i have not paid a tithe because it's not required of the new testament church and ever since i started instituting blessing the the less fortunate we that is and looking out for others i was always broke when i paid tithe i ain't broke now I was in debt when I paid tithe. I am debt free now. And not just me, everyone who followed the biblical way and not listening to the lie, but God is going to curse you if you don't pay tithe. Get out of here. Read your scriptures. Tithing was for the Levitical priest. You are not a Levite. You are not a Levite. And the people in your church are not of the tribe of Israel, to whose who are commanded by Lord to pay them. So the long story is this. This will be talking about healing. You will never be healed in this life. If you continue to subscribe to the tradition and to the greed of men and pulpit bandits. But if you want to be the few to break away and literally follow the rules of the scriptures, then you will see the manifestation of the power of God. I will end with this. The quality of your life is predicated on how much of the word of God you grab a hold of, believe, and actually do. And that will guarantee where you'll have 30, 60, or even 100 full. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your knowledge and your understanding of Scripture. Father, I am so happy that myself and millions of others who grab a hold of the revelation of the Scriptures are now doing it your way, as opposed to pushing aside the commandment of God and going with the commandments of men. We choose not to do that. We choose not to be a part of the, the foolish trend and follow your word and you have literally shown yourself strong in our circumstances. Father, we repent right now for every lie that we subscribe to, every false prophet that put their wicked no good hands on us and prophesy lies, every evil that was spewed from wherever we went that was supposed to be a service of God, but it was a den of devils. Every agreement that we came in contact with, whether we were aware of it or not, right now in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus and by the power you've given us, Father God, to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the devil, when we're taking that power right now and utilizing it and breaking every evil covenant, every time we held the hand of a false prophet and prophetess, every time they anointed us with their evil oils. Every time they spoke into our lives the filthy lies, Father, we renounce. Father, we reject. Father, we condemn. Father, we pray that you would divorce us from those evil, subtle covenants that have shackled us spiritually, anchored us, and caused us not to be catapult. But this day by faith, this day that now we have come into the recognition according to Matthew 10 verse 1, when you said you have given us power over evil spirits to cast out devils and to remove all sickness and all manner of diseases, your word declares in Luke 10 verse 19, 
again, that you have given us power over the scorpions and serpents and all the works of the devil, and nothing by no means shall harm us. Your word declares that greater is he that is in us than any devil that is in the world. Father, with that we stand in full confidence that no curse from man, no lies, no threats, no intimidation from the pulpit could ever get us to be so intimidated and stupid to turn away from your words because we fear men. This day, Father God, this day is a new day. This is the day, Father God, that we have concretely made up in our mind. No longer will we eat the crumbs. No longer will we be at the back of the line. No longer will we be waiting, trying to appease some human for you to work for us. No, you never talk no mess, but no covering. You never talk no mess that we're going to be cursed if we don't pay time. Your word is very clear. Behold, I've given you power. We don't have to go to nobody for that. We get that straight from the one who have died and become the sacrifice. No pastor became no sacrifice. No pastor took a spear on his side. No pastor had no thorns on his head. No pastor was nailed to the cross. Every pastor, every preacher, every teacher, every apostle, every whoever is supposed to point us to you. And many have failed in doing that. But Father God, we are equally as guilty because we followed them when your rules were there. So Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you for releasing us from the shackles, from the anchors, and we honor you, Father God, in all that we do by initially blessing those that are less fortunate. And every time we do that according to your word, not Kevin's opinion, we are doing it unto you. So on the day of reckoning, we are guaranteed that we the righteous, we the sheep, will be seated at your right hand and qualified to enter into the kingdom of God that was prepared for us before the foundation of the world. Father, we bless you, we honor you, we praise you, and we seal this prayer in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So folks, that is it for me, and I will see you next week. God spares life with part four to this awesome teaching. He has sent his word.